I'm going to talk about two big labor policy ideas. So as you probably all are aware, our country faces monumental economic and political challenges. 40 plus years of uh, wage stagnation, near record levels of economic inequality, huge divides across class, race and gender. Um, we also have a p captured political democracy. You also are probably all aware that unions and collective bargaining play a central role in addressing these major challenges, raise wages for workers, reduce inequality, close pay gaps, uh, and also provide a voice for workers, encouraging them to participate in the political process as well as behind the scenes, doing the behind the scenes work to make sure that the policies they support get enacted. So we need to support unions and collective bargaining. And of course, we need to do more grassroots organizing and the strikes that we're seeing, and that's a big step. We also need to do the kind of legislation that's finally on the table, the Protect Workers' Right to Organize Act, which will ensure that all workers have basic rights to strike and that penalties, for example, will be increased when employers violate the law. Those are sort of the, the first steps that we need to do. But I'm going to talk about two bigger longer term steps that we need to take as well. And those two, we also need to promote what's called sectoral bargaining. And we need to ensure that our policies provide an active encouragement for workers to join unions. So let me talk about each of those two ideas. All right. Nice to have a supportive audience. I thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so the idea behind sectoral bargaining, so our current system encourages what's known as worksite by worksite bargaining. So say all of the butchers at a particular supermarket want to join a union. They'll, they'll you know, have a go through a process and they get, they get to bargain just for themselves. Well, that leaves out lots of different kinds of workers. All of the workers at, at the rest of the supermarket, other workers at other supermarkets, the rest of the butchers around. And so we want to find ways to bargain at a much higher and broader level so that we can cover lots more workers, so that we can take wages out of competition, so that we can raise standards for, for everyone. The, that's the goal. And why we want to do that, why we want to bargain in this different way that complements worksite bargaining, but that sets broad standards for most workers doing similar kinds of work. So the first and most important reason is that this leads to much higher levels of coverage. Right now, as you probably are aware, union density is only 6% in the private sector. Let's say we double or triple that. We're still leaving 80% of workers out unless we bargain in a different way. The second reason we want to do this is when we bargain this way, it's, it's really well suited for the way the modern mar labor market is structured with companies increasingly fissuring and contracting out layers and layers of contracting that make it really hard to bargain with the company in power to really hard to set standards. The third reason we want to do this is because you're covering a lot more workers, raising more wages for more people, and covering the hardest to cover that are in subcontracted industries, you reduce economic inequality more. You also do more to close pay gaps across race and gender. It also, there's some better economics going on as well that's better for the larger economy. So when you take wages out of competition and you standardize them, you force companies to compete on a level playing field and force them to compete based on productivity rather than squeezing workers. And that leads to, um, uh, over the long run, standards that can improve for all, everyone because we're more productive as an economy. And the last reason I think this is a good move to make is that it makes very clear that unions are in the public interest. They're not just a special interest, but are working for all workers and can raise standards for all workers. So that's the first thing. That's, you know, we need to move towards sectoral bargaining. We also need to provide incentives for workers to join unions, not just say, you know what, we're okay with things being you have some rights now, good luck going out and trying to organize. We want to put our thumb on the scale and say, we are going to encourage you to join unions. Just as we do for small businesses, we don't just say, hey, you know what, we're going to let the big businesses dominate, hope good luck competing. We do a bunch of things for small businesses. We have antitrust to try to, we don't do a good enough job with it, but we have antitrust to crush monopolies. We have uh, government contracting set-asides where we provide incentives. We provide, you know, a certain percentage of contracts are going to go to government to small businesses, we have small business administration providing loans and grants. 
we can do a similar kind of thing. And in fact, this is around the world, the few places that have strong unions and stable and high density, Belgium, Denmark, Sweden, they have this system where they actually encourage unions to play a key role in helping deliver public benefits like unemployment insurance, as Indy was talking about, or and so we can adapt our workforce training system. We can adapt our enforcement of workplace laws to give unions a key role where they have access to workers to able to recruit them and are given this sort of stamp of approval. And that can help strengthen and increase union density. So this is a big, big agenda. It's a big step forward, but the two big things we need to think about, we want to bargain in a different way and we want government to actively be on the side of encouraging union membership. Thank you.